Okay, so we are streaming live on Facebook and I'm so excited. Um, I'm so excited about this because even though I've told Josh this a million times, I'm excited to share with uh, my community the story about how you and I met because it was couldn't have been more random. And this was in your mind. I mean, was it like six years ago? I feel like it was, it was a yeah. long time, like maybe 20, I don't know, was it 2014? 2014, yeah, August. I think it was in August. It was during the summer at some point, yeah. Yeah, we were at the Ancestral Health Symposium in Berkeley, California, which still today, to this day, of all the symposiums I've gone to with Ancestral Health, that was sort of um, the most pivotal for me, not only in meeting people like you, but um, that really elevated my sort of biohacking and my wellness journey. Um being inspired by the people I met as well as the, the lectures that I went to from the paleo mom to Daryl Edwards to, um, oh my God, I think even, um, I'm just trying to think, I think even Dave Asprey was there, Rob, I mean, it was, it was a good group. Dr. Kelly Ann was there. Um, there was a lot. Um, Melissa Hartwig, I remember meeting there, Dallas. Um, yeah, it was. Um, Jimmy Moore, I think he was there. Yeah, and that was like when he just came out with Keto Clarity, which seems like eons ago, you know? And I, actually that was, that really helped me because I was doing keto then and I was having some issues. And that was the, the first time that the paleo mom talked about the hormone issues that women can have with keto. And I felt like in that whole auditorium, she was talking just to me. And I was like, mm. oh, that's the problem, you know? So. <laughs> It was really amazing. But at that time, and this is why I want to share this story, you were like, you were just like I was transitioning in the work that I was doing. You were transitioning in your life and you had said, you had shared at lunch. You haven't gave us samples. I want to do a sweet potato cookie company is what I remember it to be. I could be wrong. Yep. And we sampled them and they were delicious. And then that was it. I mean, other than we followed each other on LinkedIn, became friends on social media. And I have been sort of like, you know, Mrs. Kravitz from, you know, Bewitched, watching everything you're <laughs> doing and just have watched you, you know, take a dream and make it a business. And that's why I'm so excited to have this conversation with you because I personally want to know, I've watched, but we haven't had a real chance to sort of talk intimately like we're going to now and i think that a lot of people would want to hear the story and i think that 2020 is a pivotal time for everyone where it's important for us to take a step back and look at our lives and if we have a dream maybe now is the time even though it's the most uncertain and strangest economy in the world but it also is a time where we realize the value of each day freedoms the life living life following our dreams, not wasting any time. And you, I've just been in awe of watching you from start to finish. So I would just like to know, first of all, I don't remember the story, but how did you even get the idea that you wanted to do a sweet potato company? Well, I guess that that kind of the, the beginning of that story or the genesis of it was I was I was living in LA. I was born and raised in Massachusetts, but uh, I was living in LA I had a, a friend in uh, Santa Monica who introduced me to paleo. I think I was probably about 2011 or so. Okay. And then I, I um, tried, I mean, I was, I tried to eat healthy, but I was sort of like the whole grain sort of, you know, healthy, sort of the more traditional what people like low fat, um, you know, eat your, eat your veggies and eat your low fat chicken sort of healthy. Wow. And uh, I started to experiment with sort of the, the gluten-free kind of paleo, removing the grains, removing the refined sugars. And I discovered through that that I, I um, energy level is a little bit better. But I think the thing that I really noticed was sort of like um, psychological or like mood. You know, I wasn't like clinically depressed, but I just noticed that I'd have a little bit more consistency when you have a little, you know, those little, those little down periods that you'd, you'd find. And so I, um, I really appreciated that and I took note of it. Um, my uh, Catholic faith is very important to me. So soon thereafter, I entered a Catholic seminary in Boston and discerned the calling to the priesthood for about two and a half years. Uh, and during that time, I kind of took a kind of close, closer look at the spiritual aspect of food. There's kind of this phrase of grace builds upon nature. 
Um, and so our bodies are important. We are material creatures, so we have to take care of them, take stewardship over them. So I kind of reflected upon that. And about two and a half years into that experience, I had uh, sort of a very specific moment in prayer where God said, you're not called to the priesthood, uh, go to Las Vegas and start a business. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and so, um, and I had this strong passion for food and kind of this awareness of the importance of food and how much of an impact it has us has on us, um, both on a physical level, but on a, a mental level and a spiritual level. And um, I knew, um, and I wanted to kind of create something that was kind of paleo friendly. So like you were mentioning, I, I had originally come up with a the sweet potato cookie, but prior to the sweet potato cookie, I had done an almond flour cookie, which I had found a recipe online and, and, and just was kind of was working with that and see if I could kind of commercialize that. And, um, and I tried a sweet potato flour, which I had found online, mm -hmm. kind of substituted the sweet potato flour uh, for the almond flour. And that tasted really good. I thought it tasted better. And kind of knowing the paleo world, ancestral health world, uh, kind of you can get, you can kind of go nuts on nuts. So sometimes nuts will lead to digestive problems depending mm -hmm. on your situation. And so I, but sweet potatoes for the most part are kind of universally kind of uh, accepted as kind of a healthy food and tend to be uh, better with people with restricted diets. Although I have met people that have had trouble with sweet potatoes, but uh, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. When I started the business, I'd have sweet potatoes like once or twice a week and now it's every single day and I have not gotten <laughs> sick of it. So it's kind of funny, so it's definitely a calling. So yeah, so that's what basically led me to kind of decide on sweet potatoes and um, in the process of me trying to figure out a way to make sweet potato flour in a way that retain the nutrients, you know, cause like, you know, I was very focused, you know, going to the ancestral health symposiums. I went to the other one in Boston in 2012. I just okay. missed the, the first one at UCLA, but you know, there's always this great focus on, you know, nutrients and nutrient retention, you know, and how do we, how do we retain the nutrients within the food that we're eating? And so I was doing a lot of research on that and my research led me to freeze drying because freeze drying in terms of a preservation process yeah. gives you the best uh, means of preserving the nutrients. Uh, the research out there is it's, as you, as it enters the freeze dry machine, it's like 98 to 99% nutrient retention if you store it properly. And so uh, I took note of that and um, I uh, started looking to, like, how am I gonna get a freeze dryer, get access to <laughs> freeze drying? And it just at about, at, at about that time, about maybe like three months earlier, a company in Utah had come out with the first uh, home freeze dryer. Because prior to that, they were exorbitantly expensive. And, uh, I, you know, I said I'd worked as an actor in LA and I just happened to get a, um, a car commercial check for a Suzuki car commercial I'd done a few years ago. And it was just for the right amount. And I did a little kind of prayerful discernment as to what to do. And I figured, well, I'll buy the freeze dry machine. Uh, and if it works out, well, I'll keep using it. Otherwise I'll just Craigslist it. And so I, um, I did some more research on like how to stabilize the sweet potato and talk to a few more people. And then I started freeze drying sweet potatoes and I liked the texture. And I thought that was so unique of these, you know, mm -hmm. slices or slabs that I came up with uh, based on our process that I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty unique. Um, and also, I'm, I'm, I'm very good friends with uh, the folks at Eating Evolved Chocolate. And I was talking oh to them. Oh, my God, I love them. Yeah, they're great. They, I love their chocolate. I love them. Um, and uh, they, they had kind of given me some, uh, some advice as a mentor, business mentor. And one of the things that's important in the food industry is shelf life. And so I'm sitting there thinking, well, you can't do much better than freeze dried in terms <laughs> of shelf life. So because uh, logistically, like, you know, if you have a product, you know, if it has to be like refrigerated or frozen, that's, it makes things a bit more expensive. But like mm -hmm. our product, like we, we just need a shelf, just room temperature. So um, yeah, so then I uh, was experimenting a little bit more. I was kind of, I moved home to my parents for a little while and I was experimenting in the garage and uh, kind of had come up with something that uh, both people that were kind of health oriented, like that preferred super healthy food liked, but also people that like you know, weren't so concerned about eating sort of healthy things also right. like the taste of it. And so that was sort of a moment where I felt like I had something that was unique and might have some wide appeal. And um, so then the next step was I just packed up a cargo van and with, you know, a thousand pounds of stuff in my freeze dry machine and drove cross country and uh, eventually 
he was able to finally get it to the farmer's market where, uh, where people started to respond to it pretty well. And, and the next step was to get my own facility and kind of take it from there. And now here we are, we're still trying to, still trying to grow. It's a, it's a tough thing in the food business. I've talked to other food entrepreneurs about this. The scaling issue is always, it's challenging. Um, it could be, you know, cost intensive, but also, mm -hmm. Uh, it's just difficult to, because you have a, you have a unique process. If you come up with a unique product, it's usually a unique process that goes along with it. So, or to get yourself to be able to scale it to, you know, a lot of people asking me if they're, you know, if we're in stores nearby them all across the country and we're, uh, we're trying to get there, but we're not there yet. So it's just a little bit of a process. So. But That's it's great of, that they can order directly from you, which yes. also I think is really powerful right now in 2020. I, as many things as I can get delivered right to my door is I'm leaning more towards that, you know, just keeps life a little simpler. So, um, you know, if they can't get you in a store, at least they can order direct. And um, you've been generous enough to give a discount code to my followers. I know somebody texted me over the weekend. They're like, I got the variety pack. I can't wait. <laughs> but I really wanted to address the comment that you made about freeze drying. Um, as many, everyone knows, I have multiple sclerosis, Epstein-Barr, Hashimoto's, Lyme disease. You know, I'm just a basket of autoimmune issues. And I follow the Walls protocol. And Dr. Terry Walls uh, does a seminar every year. Well, of course, not this year, but she has done a, an in-person seminar. And several years ago, she had a gentleman who plays for the Philadelphia Symphony. And he has MS, and his name is Bob Kafar. And he has also managed to... Uh, symptomatically manage MS, reverse all of his symptoms, but not following the Walls protocol. And Terry had him, Dr. Walls had him present. He studied the Japanese population because there is no MS there and he wanted to know why. They do a lot of freeze drying of food. So his entire diet is 100% freeze dried food. And because oh. he's with the symphony, he travels all over performing. Now, mind you, he couldn't play. His MS was so bad that he almost couldn't perform, which um, my daughter's a full-time artist and she had some issues with her vocal cords early on and she couldn't sing for six months and I thought she was almost suicidal. Like that is her therapy, you know, and Bob, mm -hmm. same thing with, you know, Bob and I are now friends and plus I'm from Philly, so my heart is with him. But freeze drying, not only holding the nutrients, but really is almost a nutrient dense approach to um, you know, hunter gatherer kind of eating in the sense that you can, he takes this food with him wherever he goes and never has to worry because of shelf life, it's got all the nutrient density. And um, although he sort of follows maybe the walls protocol in a sense that he doesn't eat refined sugars or grains or gluten or any of that stuff, but he only eats freeze dried. And um, that was my first introduction really to anything freeze dried. And then the first product was your product, which I have everything here. Um, so it started out, I guess, with just the plain old sea salt, right? Which is still yeah. my fave. Well, and then actually, old... actually, the first the first flavor I ever experimented with was a cinnamon flavor. We used to call it original awesome, but it was a little confusing. So, but the cinnamon was the first one because that was how I used to eat it just myself before I ever started freezing. The cinnamon on it, that's how I eat my sweet potatoes. Yeah, it's a great combo. It is. I had one this morning, actually, with my breakfast. Um, and then the dar the dill and garlic is pretty yum. Mm -hmm. That Love was the, that. that was our probably when I started at the farmer's market, that was the, the most popular flavor. I'd say like right now, now that we've kind of gotten wider distribution, sea salt's probably the, the best seller, but dill and garlic was pretty darn close to being the Real top good. seller. I love dill and there's just not enough use of dill, I think, in recipes. Like I make a sweet potato salad with dill mm. in one of my cooking classes. I it just, and everyone, whenever I serve it, people are like, oh, I never would have thought to put dill. And I'm like, I know, like, I would love to add dill to everything. And I try and grow dill in my garden. And I don't know why I haven't been able to grow it, but, and then now this one I haven't tried yet. This is my, um, tomorrow I'm going to my friend. She lives on the beach in San Clemente, huge deck. And I'm bringing this bag. I'm sharing. I, I share. Cool. So the Chipotle, is this the newest flavor? Uh, pro yeah, probably. We haven't come up with a new flavor in a little while, but that was the last flavor that we, we developed. So, yep, that's the newest one. Yep. Okay. Who's the little cutie in the video that literally uh, I want to hug and kiss that eats <laughs> and cries and is most adorable human being? That's my niece. My niece, Jay. serious? Yeah, she's she's a natural in front of the camera. She's she's a she's a bit of a bit of a ham there. So, but she's great. 
oh my, every time I want to eat these. I mean, she's just, I mean, gosh, she is so cute. I literally send her video on my email blast all the time just because I think she's so adorable. And <laughs> she, she loves, she loves eating them. She eats them all the time, like all the different flavors. It's like her, one of her favorite things to eat. It's a lot, a lot of, oh, hello. my dog is climbing up my leg. She wants to be a part of it. So, ah, uh, gotcha. Up. Um, yeah, no, she is absolutely adorable. And that's the thing that I like is that, I mean, these are great snacks to give to your kids, you know, like stop giving them Cheerios and give them a, I call it the awesome. I just think the name is, you know, they are awesome. Um, oh, it's kind of, that's part of the inspiration for we're, you know, trying to be an influence in the snack world of creating something that has that texture of of the Cheetos and the Doritos and the sort of the junk food out there, but without the junk, it's like, you know, uh, it has that junk food texture, but it doesn't have all the preservatives and sugars and, you know, extra sort of stuff. And that's, that's hopefully, hopefully we can create a movement where this is becomes wide, you know, more mainstream. We got a few competitors so that, you know, the, you know, products like this are available more widely. So. Well, competition is, you know, means that it's a great idea. So, all right, the ingredients, just so that you understand what the ingredients are here, organic sweet potatoes, organic virgin coconut oil, sea salt, organic, um, how do you say that, Keelan? That type of uh, uh, Ceylon, Ceylon. Ceylon cinnamon. And um, yeah, so it's all organic. And <laughs> I got to tell you, I've been trying to do some recipe development and I have a really hard time because I just love them right out of the bag that I'm like eating them as I'm pairing them with things. Um, very, very, very delicious. And like I said, definitely different than what you first introduced me to, but still along the same line. So how difficult was the leap or was it sort of a natural progression for you to be like, okay, I'm going to make this like the first time you were at the farmer's market, were you excited? Were you nervous? Did did you learn a lot? Like, you know, were there steps along the way that you took because um, of feedback you got at the farmer's market? Like, how, how does it go from, okay, I get that check. I'm now going to, you know, buy this dehydrator and I'm going to open at the farmer's market. And then, I mean, I know now that you're in some um, Whole Foods, you're in Ear One. Like, how, what is the time frame? Like, does it take six years to go from the farmer's market to there? Like, how does that all happen for someone if they were trying to do this? Well, I think there's a number of factors involved. Um, we, uh, <laughs> or the first day I set up at the farmer's market, I think if you go to, you go to our Instagram and you go all the way down to like one of the first few posts, you can see our, my table. And I, <laughs> I think I just put out like four bags on the table. <laughs> Somebody else who commented, he's like, you need to put more bags on the table. <laughs> Uh, so I was kind of looking back, that was kind of funny. So I, I learned how to like fill the table and make it, you know, have, have some more, you know, uh, decorative exactly. effect, if you will. Um, but I think uh, the farmer's market is especially valuable because you can get that, you know, if you have samples, you usually, most people sample at the farmer's markets, you can get some immediate feedback from people right there on the spot. And you can tell if people like it or not. You know, you get you, you get folks who walk up there like, oh, I love supporting small business. I'm gonna buy a bag. But when you start getting people that come back consistently or give you, you can really mm -hmm. see that authentic response, uh, that's very helpful, you know. And so farmers market's a great place to kind of kind of see if you're you, if you've got an audience, if you've got a customer that's gonna be willing to, you know, uh, to pay for it. Um, so I think the, the thing is, is that like, I think from going from once you've kind of confirmed that you have something that uh, people like is, you know, the next step is just, just kind of like about that scaling and kind of like what we've been doing the past couple of years is really kind of proving the concept because, you know, for other, you know, if you want, if like, for example, if you had like a bar, like a the energy bar or something like that, there's a lot of mechanisms out there for you to be able to a lot of other co-packers or co-manufacturers that could kind of help you out with that. Um, but for our situation, it's a little bit difficult. We kind of had to build out our own facility just to kind of be able to prove the concept. Um, I, I remember I, I did early on, and it was in San Diego, I did a gluten-free festival. Uh, it was over at the fairgrounds, I think. And uh, I remember <laughs> I remember two, two people in particular, and it, it, was, um, it was two guys from like a big sort of like food company came over 
and uh, and they looked at the product and they kind of liked it. And they were like, and they kind of shook their heads. They're like, how are you going to make that in larger quantities? And I was just like, I don't know. I'm going to figure out a way. I remember that. And then like, and there was, and there was two like um, nutritionists that came over, naturopathic doctors or nutritionists. They walked over and they said something to the effect. So we, we walked around this whole floor and this is the only thing that's healthy here. And so it's always, um, it's always a challenge. I think when you come up with something unique, that's worthwhile to, to kind of scale it. Uh, but you know, we're building, we're building that case and slowly, but surely we're figuring things out. That's what business is all about. It's just about yeah. problem solving, you know, and you figure out, um, you just figure out ways to do things and you put in a lot of sweat and, and you stay persistent and you have faith and, you know, things, things will, things turn around. So that's, do you that's, know, um, the company base culture, have you ever heard of them? I've heard the name, but I'm not super familiar with them. Okay. It's a uh, woman owned and, uh, founded and, uh, they make paleo brownies granola and bread and keto bread okay and she had the same problem she couldn't find a co-packer because the process that she uses there's nobody it's like nobody out there so she had to build in Clearwater her own facility mm. to be able to scale her price she's now in Walmart but she wasn't able to find anyone in America that could produce her brownies, um, especially because it is certified gluten-free. Like you also have to, you know, you have that extra level of, you can't do it in a factory that does anything with gluten. And most brownies and co-packers that are making brownies have gluten. And it was very interesting to, to you know, learn about that. Just like you're saying, you know, it's, it, it's okay to scale, but you can get to a certain point where, hey, I, I can't produce it because I'm literally doing this by myself. And I think that's the part um, she had to actually have equipment built like just for her, you mm -hmm. know, that just did. So um, if you ever want uh, I'd be, um, Jordan, I'd be happy to introduce you to, to Jordan. Um, but yeah. And, and that takes everything to a whole new level. And um, the nice thing I know that happened for her was now she has been able to market her. She's also a co-packer. So she not uh, only produces her own product, but she does, she markets to other companies and produces for them. So that's mm. sort of how she, she built a $4 million facility. She got a $2 wow. million SBA loan and then matched it with, she raised $2 million in friends and family. God bless her. I mean, that's not easy to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I like to share these stories because I think that you know, a lot of people, you know, I know a lot of people even come to me and they're like, well, how did you become paleo boss lady? I'm like, well, I didn't really set out to be paleo boss lady. I just was by myself looking for community and it sort of grew, but that's not really any different than you having a calling saying you're not meant to be serving the Lord right now. You're meant to have a food company and nourish people through food and educate them. You know, it's an awakening that happens within us that it's like, okay, like I went from, okay, this is just a place where I'm going for support to like, well, no, I actually have a role and a responsibility now with what I'm doing as a brand. Um, and that's why, you know, I reached out to you because of several things. One is I just really admire your tenacity, your persistence, your drive, your work ethic, your lens. Um, just, I just really, I, I feel like very grateful for a lot of the people that I've met sort of randomly um, just the way that we met, which was very random. I also met at that same time, Dr. Nasha Winters, who I'm so grateful for her. Um, but the other thing is, is that, you know, I think it's really important to be able to share with people that, you know, the road to entry is not that hard. It just takes, um, I mean, what for me, it just takes, people think that I don't have fear, but it just, it just takes slow steady steps like it seems like you were like okay tweaking the product i mean how long were you in the kitchen like trying to tweak because when i from when i met you to your first farmer's market how long would you say that was a year two years i don't know uh well i the trick with getting into the farmer's market is the uh, local you get we got like a what's called a cottage food license uh -huh. so you can sell locally up to a certain amount um but the issue was is that like you could do dried fruits fairly easily but because sort of the chemistry and biology of vegetables is different uh they wouldn't allow uh dried vegetables so we had to actually get a water activity test we had to get a lab test to prove to them that it was stable enough 
Um, so that took a while. And during that time, I was also trying to find a co-packer. Uh, but I eventually just, you know, we, we talked to the people at the health department out here in Las Vegas, we got the test and then we sort of got, got rolling, but it was, um, it was sort of funny, like the process that I, I'd, I'd done a couple different ways to sort of, you know, bake or heat up the sweet potato, but actually the process that we use now was the way that I would essentially, um, bake the sweet potatoes just to eat them. I would tweak the temperature because I, there's a few things that I, there's a certain texture coming out of the oven that we kind of know that is optimal for freeze drying. And, uh, and so I had to kind of play around with that. So like, once we came up with the idea, once I run the initial first run through the sweet potato, eh, before we got something that was kind of like closer to what we have now is eh, a couple, like a couple months of just kind of tweaking and oh, okay. playing around with. So, yeah. And so, um, and then we've kind of like, as we moved into a facility, new facility, we, you know, had a different, like a commercial oven. And so I had to like, kind of readjust and reevaluate because like you kind of have you know where it needs to be and oftentimes the machinery you're using um needs to be tweaked a little bit and also it, different times of the year sweet potatoes uh you know they, they've been in the ground longer or shorter uh -huh. periods of time so you kind of have to tweak things a little bit here and there too so it's the always texture is amazing i think that's what you know the only thing i can relate it to is i like to eat dried mangoes and it's a interesting texture i feel like the freeze-dried texture of the sweet potatoes it's like when you have your first bite it's like every every one is like i don't know i just love i love it so much more than just a chip of any kind it's you know it's i i, I just don't know how to describe the way the sweet potato like melts in your i don't know the whole thing and the french fries are just unbelievable and I think every kid would absolutely love those, you know, like I'm gonna have a grandbaby next month and I can't wait to give my granddaughter when she's old enough, her first awesome French fry. Oh. You know, I could just see them, you know, it'd be great like first food for a young kid, you know what I mean? So yeah. excited. Cheerios, toxic <laughs> Cheerios is what people give their kids. I'm giving the awesome to my granddaughter. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like I, I, I and I think your niece inspired me because I mean, I, you know, she just loves them. Um, so has COVID changed your business or the way that you work? Like I know one of the companies that we're really good friends with is Sweet Apricity. Tanya, I love her, love her, we're dear, dear friends. And she gets her lily seeds for her lily puffs from India. So COVID, you know, there's a supply chain issue. And the sad truth is just like you, she's a small business. And there are other larger companies that use those lily seeds. So the people in the United States that do have inventory, they're not interested in selling a small quantity to a small woman owned business. She's basically competing with like General Mills, that's, you know, big names. So it has created sort of supply chain issues for her, you know, and, and I just wonder, have you had any situations like that? You know, obviously sweet potatoes, it's a whole different thing, but has COVID changed your business in any way? Um, like maybe your bags, I don't know, or is everything here in the U S you know, you don't, you know, I'm just wondering. Yeah, we, we, uh, well, we source our sweet potatoes from California. Um, okay. yeah, the, up there in Merced County, which is the, uh, California is number two in terms of the U S in terms of uh, producing sweet potatoes right behind North Carolina. Okay. Um, and so that's, so, you know, being able to source them in California has been, has been good. The trick there though, we, we finally had found someone here in Las Vegas that was bringing in, was able to, because they were doing runs uh, up to that part of California, sourcing other sort of, you know, produce for, they, they would, um, they would source produce for a lot of the hotels in the strip. And so we sort of worked something out with them that they could, uh, you know, pay them a certain amount and it worked out really good. It was very cost effective for us and time, time is money, that sort of thing for them to be able to bring the sweet potatoes and actually deliver them to us. So with all the stuff that I'm dealing with, that was quite helpful. But then with COVID and basically the all of Las Vegas Boulevard shut being down. shut down, uh, that, that, that kind of went away. So I've kind of have to, I started out taking my cargo van, driving, <laughs> driving to California. Uh, luckily there's, uh, there's a couple spots in Southern California, which is a little bit closer that they can, 
the company that we get them from, the farm that we get them from, will drive them down to, the, to SoCal, and which makes it a little bit easier. I had I have had to go all, all the way up to Merced County, which is like a six and a half hour drive, and then all the way back. Wow. Uh, so that's uh, that's kind of changed things a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, prior prior to COVID, I mean, in the feed and the food business, you're always conscious about you know keeping your hands washed and everything clean. So there's probably maybe a little bit more, you know, uh, diligence about, you know, sanitizing doorknobs and stuff like that. And, and you know, uh, uh, little tables where, where, where guys eat lunch and that sort of thing. But for the most part, we were just ridiculously busy during that time because, you know, the one thing that was going on is people were buying food. You know, maybe they're mm -hmm. staying at home and trying to stay healthy. And so our, ours, you know, being a very healthy sort of product, you know, is doing doing pretty well. And so, um yeah, so we're just I, COVID just made us that much more busier for the most part. So I'm really grateful to hear that most of the um, companies that I partner with and the companies whose products I use can report the same. And that makes me feel really good because I feel like that means a larger majority of people are realizing that using this time to, you know, eat cleaner, think smarter about what they're putting in their body to boost their immune system. I can tell you that sweet potatoes have always been really important to my well-being because I have a lot of spasms due to MS and the potassium and sweet, you know, sweet potatoes has really been helpful. And I also do a tremendous amount of yoga. And I find that if I don't have, I'm sorry, I, where I live, we constantly have helicopter. Like there's a lot of, um, Helicopters. Oh, the, uh, is it the naval naval base nearby? The or? naval base is there, but we have a lot of gang stuff going on here too. Oh. Lots of shootings and mm. it's interesting. Um, it's just like when I lived in Venice Beach. So I can't believe you lived in Santa Monica in 2011 because I was there. Um, I was I living. In, I was living in Hollywood, but I would I would make it over there a lot. So okay, I lived Monica. in Venice from 2006 until uh, 2016 when I started. Well. 2015 to 16, I lived in Santa Monica, but the rest of the time I lived in Venice Beach, like right off Abbot Kinney. Um, I, I love, I love Venice. I really enjoy every time I get to go back and visit friends. It's I, I enjoy Venice. So. Yeah. Now I'm down in Escondido. I'm more in the San Diego area. And if all goes well in three weeks, I'm going to make settlement on a house and I'll be living a little further, like more towards Palm Springs area. So cool. cool. We'll see. Um, we'll see if that happens. I hate to get excited because just, you know, you know how it is when you're applying for a mortgage, you know, you're with the underwriter and basically who knows what they're going to say and do. Um, so as far as I know that we talked about, you know, you are in, in is it only in California or is it in Vegas too? some of the Whole Foods? Uh, yeah, uh, all of the Whole Foods in Las Vegas, there's four here in Las Vegas and then California, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 25 or so. It's all listed oh, on the website. And then in Arizona, I think there's about uh, six to eight or so. So we're in Arizona, uh, Southern California, and uh, Las Vegas. And hopefully by the end of this year, uh, we will be in Hawaii, which is part of the same region of Whole Foods. So uh, that's that That would be probably the next intermediate step. And then after that, maybe uh, NorCal. So Awesome. And um, you can't get the awesome on Amazon. So the best thing is, is to go direct. And realize that that really helps a small business. I know Amazon for a lot of us appears to be more convenient, but you know, I'd rather say, you know, Jeff Bezos doesn't need to make any more money uh, and small business can really do well um, if you, you know, support them this way and it comes right to your door. So I am excited because I'm actually working on some recipes using the awesome and um, I can't wait to share those. And I do have a coupon code, which I'll go back and put it in the link. Um, they don't let you really do all that um, when you go from Zoom. But I want to just check and just see on my face on my page if there's any questions that people have because they don't come up on Zoom. So if there's any questions that people have, we can answer them before I let you go back to making um, making okay, the awesome. I see some comments. Um, Ready to place my AIP sampler order. Can you share your code here? Okay. Uh, he was great. Uh, okay. So let's see. I, I should know my code off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, so let me pull it up. I think it's Paleo Boss to tell you the truth. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. I could, I could look it up here. Um, 
Yeah, I'm the worst. I wish I had the same code for like every sponsor, but it doesn't work that way because some people can only give me what they can give me. So um, let's see. It is Paleo Boss. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So let me put that on there right now because people are asking. And that's the other thing. Let's talk about AIP. I think that a lot of people, for me, um, that's one of the reasons why I love Sweet Apricity as well, because, you know, when I started doing paleo, that was one thing, but I had to do the autoimmune protocol for a while because it's very important for me to know what my body reacts to. So that's kind of, you know, autoimmune protocol for those that aren't familiar is a form of elimination. Um, got it. Thanks. Okay. I'm just going to put code. Let me just write this on here. Um, and it's kind of nice when you're doing an autoimmune protocol, which can be very restrictive and very hard. I found it to be the hardest thing I ever did to be able to have sort of something that feels treat like a treat, which sweet potato awesome. The awesome feels like a treat. It does. It feels like a treat. And that's why I like sweet apricity because they're autoimmune protocols. So when you're doing these sort of elimination or harder protocols, when you have products, companies like Sweet Potato Awesome, Sweet Apricity, like you can still, again, you, you talked about it's the mental, you know, it's the mental part of the game when you're entering, you know, this world of conscious eating. And if, if all you see is deprivation, deprivation, what you can't have, it becomes a hard thing. And having a product that is AIP compliant, that works for people that are following a much more rigid form of paleo, I think it's just such a gift because when I first started all this in 2009, there was no sweet, there was no you. There was none of this stuff, you know, and it was really hard to navigate. And I used to hold classes, believe it or not, I was one of the first, I used to own a wellness center in Los Angeles and Culver City on Washington Boulevard. It's still there to this day I, that I built. And we were the first in LA Whole30 certified place. So we could teach people how to do Whole30s. And I was the one that would do that. And that was the biggest complaint. Like, what can I have in a pinch? And at that time it was like nothing. You can eat a sweet potato that you cook in the oven. But if I could have just given them a bag of the awesome, they, it would have been a less deprivation.